Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, the show where great dentistry meets great business. As always, Jesse Green at the control panel with you today. And today, I'm really excited to be having a conversation with someone who I regard as not just a good mentor, but someone who's a good friend, James Shramko. James is well known as the CEO and founder of Superfast Business. He is a wizard at internet marketing. I've been around James's work for a number of years now. Back when I was you know, running a digital agency for dentists, James was my go-to guy there. He's an expert marketer. But we're going to have a bit of a conversation about some different stuff today because one of the things I've observed with James is he's you know, really, really good at creating a business as well as a life. And I think that's an art that not many people really do well, and he does it exceedingly well. In my own business, James has been instrumental in helping me really get some clarity about the things to focus on and really how to eliminate the day-to-day noise so that you're spending your time productively, effectively, and getting the maximum return for your effort, which has been instrumental with me and my businesses. So James, welcome to the program. It's fantastic to have you here. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, mate. And I reckon uh, we had a bit of a conversation before we started. You've been surfing today. You've had uh, your stretches. You've done all. You, you've had your life, you know, mapped out today. So tell us what a day in the life of James Fremko looks like. Sure. Well, 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 I guess if we zoom back before that, we should have a look at a week because there's a fair bit of structure to that as well. And when I started this whole idea of lifestyle design, I was a bit resistant to having a, a structure. So it, it might sound unfree to have a structure, but in short, my business activities are stacked towards Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Because look, most people aren't productive on Friday after lunchtime, and no one wants to go to work on Monday. So I just decided to eliminate those and have a four-day weekend. Every weekend, right? This is every single week. Nice. So, I mean, today we're recording on a Wednesday, and that's Wednesday and Thursday are where I open up my calendar and let other people in for activities such as recording content, coaching calls, dealing with other professional services uh, like you know lawyers or what have you, talking to people who I might do an affiliate deal with, those sort of things. Tuesdays are my coaching day where I block it just for customers and, and I stack that to the morning and the afternoon. So this is really important. What I found is by putting chunks of work earlier and then later in the day, it's still kind of like you get the day off during the middle of the day. So no matter what you do in the morning, you've got time to relax. So today, to specifically answer your question, I got up around six something. I had some coffee and some breakfast and then I did three calls. Usually I'll only do two, but I just did three calls at seven, eight, and nine. And by 10 o'clock, I was free then to go and have a surf. And after that, I had a nice healthy lunch. And after that, I did some very basic shopping near the, near where I get lunch. I came back home and had a little day sleep, which I love. I sleep every day after lunch, usually, a little siesta. Yeah, fantastic. And then I have two calls this afternoon, this one and one other. And then the rest of the days for me, that's for entertainment or reading or just pottering around my forum, answering some questions, clearing some emails. So that's a really clear example, I think, James, where structure sets you free. But was your life always like that? Was you know Because most of the people listening will be dentists and they're going, fantastic, I love the concept, but how do I kind of work that into my practice life? I'm curious about the evolution because I know you've got a history with Mercedes Benz and and the like, and you, you've got a legendary history there, which is, you know you've you've transferred some of that teaching into what you do now. But I'm curious about the evolution. How did it? How did you transition? Well, interestingly, you know, at Mercedes Benz, I was most definitely doing the employee style, you know, Monday to Sunday, <laughs> as it turned out, <laughs> most of my career. And they had 11-day fortnights. What that means is you only get three days off out of 14. That's an extra 26 days a year. It's an extra, working an extra four or five weeks compared to normal people. So it really sucked. The, the first real step is to recognize that you have the choice. And I know a lot of dentists who like golf 
and I know a couple of dentists who were Mercedes-Benz clients who'd figured out that they could book their own schedule and one of them just didn't go into the studio on Wednesdays and he just put a line through that and his staff knew that he wasn't there on Wednesdays. He's there on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. So firstly, if you're the owner, then you're in much more control. Even a lot of employees these days, companies are figuring out that they might want to let their team members have more flexible working hours or schedules. Even people in my own team who more or less full-time contractors to my business have fairly flexible timing and logistics around you know how they do their work. I don't dictate or micromanage to them how they need to do it. So if you're working in someone else's practice, it's just a matter of thinking about if you if you were to wave the magic wand and work out what would be your perfect schedule and then proposing that, figuring out a way that this that the practice could still win and that you can still win. If you own it, then you already possess a magic wand. You just gotta wave it and just make a decision to not work at certain times. I would suggest to most people, this is what I do for some of my clients who are all entrepreneurs. Some of them would be borderline workaholics. I encourage them to take an afternoon off once a, you know, one day a week. Just pick an afternoon and then I tell them to let their spouse know that that's their time to, to do things together. For one client, just the simple act of going to watch a movie in a cinema during a weekday was such a big resistance point that when we overcame that, it was sort of just the start of a slippery slope. And then he was able to carve out a whole half day and then a whole day from his routine. And then he was able to spatula his entire business out of a physical premises by selling the office and going virtual and then offshore. So just went through this whole evolution. And now he could be found at home or his local cafe working on projects at his peak times when he's most energetic, when he's most motivated rather than drudging off into an old routine. And I think the longer you've been stuck in the cog, it, it, as a cog in the machine, the harder it is to realize you know, that you can wake up out of that trance and to make changes. Just because you did things the way before doesn't mean you should do it like that in the future. You should question that. Yeah, I think that's really critical is the first thing is to ask really good quality questions. And again, I've heard you say that plenty of times that the quality of the questions will dictate the quality of the answer. But one of the things that I wanted to pick up on, James, is with that is, you know, typically, you know, there'll be the person you mentioned who would have had some resistance taking that time off to go and spend the afternoon at the movies with his wife. One of the things that, you know, I hear a lot is, you know, if I take that time away from business, I'm going to take a revenue here and I'm going to do this and do that. But my experience has been that when I actually take that time, and even if you know, I'm not necessarily going to the movies, but just creating some time in my day, you know, my productivity tends to increase. Have you kind of found that with your guys that you work with as well? Absolutely. And it's not just me. It's uh, widely held viewed by the top people in running large corporations. They spend the majority of their time thinking. A lot of resistance comes around the fact that, particularly in your profession, where quite often the person we're talking about is still somehow a revenue owner operating on on clients. I don't know what you call them. Patients, clients, take customers, <laughs> whatever, punters. Poking around their mouths and stuff. So that could be, uh, you know, you can directly relate that to, you know, time off the tools. However, there's you know, plenty of research to suggest that we're really not optimal working long days, that we have just a few hours worth of concentration available to us in, in any given day. So it would be good to stack the, the heavy work early while you've got the energy for it. And of course, it presupposes that you might be better off if you are able to hire a team. If you could bring in people into your business, if you could buy someone else's time, that gives you a lot more levers to pull. So it's most definitely how my business works. There's a, a high proportion of leverage going on. I'm still critical for my current business iteration as a coach. However, I've got a, plenty of support with things that I'm not so good at that I shouldn't be doing. And everyone has these. For a dentist, I imagine that some of them will be very tempted to do their own bookkeeping or to you know, be an office manager as well, checking the pantry that make sure there's – coffee cups and and you know supplies is the toilet paper stocked for the lavatory and those things you know you've got to get rid of all those little jobs 
and whittle it down to only the, the high value stuff. And even then, see if you can get someone else to do that. And that is by far the hardest one to replace is the thing that you are the best at. Yeah, and I think that comes down to a business model question in some senses as well. You know, the traditional practice ownership model in the past has really kind of been owner-operator. My experience, though, is that if you want to have real growth and create that business in life, then you do need that leverage that you've spoken about. And actually, one of the things you taught me a little while ago, James, which you know I now have rattling around my brain endlessly, is never get good at the little things. <laughs> do you remember saying that? I do because it, it happened to me and, and that information was passed on to me. Very early in my sales career, I was selling BMWs and then Mercedes-Benz and we didn't really have much support. There, there wasn't much in the way of help. So if, if you sold a car, you actually had, in some cases, you had to screw the number plates on and the plate frames and we, they had these one-size-fits-all rubber mats that we'd have to cut down to size for the right car. And you know, I thought these were horrid distractions. They were so removed from the ability to sell but we were expected to do all of these things. So I've schemed on ways that I could get someone else to do that stuff. So I wasn't very good with a Stanley knife. I wasn't as, you know, I wasn't able to cut the rubber as well as the other people. And, you know, my screwdriver skills left a lot to be desired. I didn't want to slip and scuff the paint on the car. So I sort of built a little infrastructure of people around me who were much better at those things than I was. And then I never have to do them anymore. Yeah, I think that's absolutely critical. Uh, you know, for the people listening, the things that you can get rid of as quickly as possible would be, you know, all those sort of menial things. But I think the thing that you touched on, James, is where the real power comes is when you can start getting rid of the things you're actually good at and free up your time for thinking and business planning and strategizing. Would that be, you know, am I representing that comment correctly? Absolutely. It's just so hard to give up something you're good at. Like a lot of people after mowing lawns for years can get quite good at it. It doesn't mean you should, <laughs> should do, do it. it. Like I can polish shoes really well after spending time in cadets at school and serving on the on the sales front line. It doesn't mean I'm going to set up a shoe shine store or get too stuck into it. There are things you can get help from. And like anyone who's ever eaten in a restaurant, which is most of your listener base, understands that there are times when it's better to let someone else go and procure the things and prepare them and to cook them and to serve them up. Just let you do the important stuff like the eating. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing that comes up all the time in the business sense as well, James, is there's so much stuff competing for our attention and, and there's this compulsion to do things, you know, get out of my way, I'll do it. No one can do it as well as I can because I'm a perfectionist by nature. So, but that is, of course, a trap. One of the things that, you know, we've spoken about time and again over a couple of years or, or however long it's been is the elegance of a simple life and what I mean by simple, I don't mean like, you know, a sparse, unfilled life, but distractions that are gone, noise that is gone, get, it's getting rid of the mental clutter. How, you know, apart from delegation and getting rid of some of those things, what else kind of feeds into that simplicity? Well, even your environment. So just simple stuff like the workspace that you operate in. You know, again, a, a dentist might be operating out of a, a studio that's got just one chair in it and only the right tools, but then they'll go out the back to the garage or to their wherever they do the accounts and it might be just a mess everywhere. So mm-hmm. it's about, <laughs> that was a nervous chuckle, it, it's really about removing things until you just have that ability to focus. So it's, uh, I think about a train on tracks, it's, it's just, it just follows the tracks doesn't have to choose. It's not in the desert, could go any direction. And typically business owners or entrepreneurs are great at seeing opportunity in everything. Oh, wow, I could do this. I could do that. And they jump down rabbit holes. They're going to get this course or learn this thing, or they might have a backlog of Kindles sitting on their iPhone that haven't been read. They bought them because they bought into the idea of it, but they didn't calculate the time required to read it and they haven't set it aside. So uh, you need filters. You need to think about of all the things I could do, what are the most important things? And of all the types of work that we do, which ones are the ones I enjoy the most or which ones are the most profitable? So you could even build a matrix that scores things as uh, you know good versus bad. And that's where you see some people start to specialize. Hey, you know, this person is the guy to go to for sports mouth guards or this this lady's the one you need to go to for braces. You know, she's the best at that because they start to figure out, hey, they love that the most and they're, they're really, really good at it. 
so you can start to to just focus more attention on the things that you want and focus less attention on the things that you don't want. So in, in every part of your life, you can probably let go of stuff. Even if you had too many pairs of shoes or too many clothes in your cupboard, it can paralyze you with choice. Again, the dentist probably has a favorite smock or eyewear or whatever whatever you use for the, the work part. But then in private life, uh, there could just be you know paralyzing amount of choice. It's actually really funny you should say that because one of the things that we've been doing in our practice is is we've been on this real simplification kind of binge and, you know, it, when you've got different clinicians or different dentists working in the one space, everyone has their own way of doing things and they prefer this instrument or that instrument. And what we've just gone through this process is we've had people working for us is we've said, okay, this is now the instrument pack. You know, it's got four things in it. And, you know, just by taking things away out of those instrument packets, it means that now it frees up the staff's time in terms of, you know, cleaning and sterilization. It means that if you really want that instrument, you know, that you need one in every hundred times, you can get it if you need it. But it means that it's not there on your on your tray table, you know, cluttering space and whatever. And we've just found that simple act of standardizing the operating packs really, really effective and cutting things out. And equally, James, I have to tell you, if you were to walk into a dental practice, I guarantee you there would be bottles and bottles of, of materials of stuff that gets used every now and then or once, you know, in a blue moon or whatever it happens to be. So we've also just gone through this process of rationalizing everything. We have one bonding agent. We have one type of, you know, filling composite resin. We have one of this, one of that. And it's honestly, it's so cathartic. And I learned that from you. Well, there you go. So and there's, there's lots of examples like Southwest planes use just the one type of airplane. So that it's much easier to train the pilots and to have the engineers working on them and to turn them around faster instead of all different sizes. Great book on this topic called Simplify by Kosh, Richard Kosh. And lots of examples about simplifiers, things that you can remove from the business and really enhance the things that you're really, really good at. Yeah, and it's funny because what I've found is the more I cut away, the happier I am too. It's just getting rid of the mental clutter as much as the physical clutter. It's quite bizarre that you know that physical environment has such a huge impact on the emotional well-being of everyone in that environment. It's quite phenomenal. Exactly. Yeah, cool. So one of the things, James, I wanted to talk to you about is coming back to you know filters. You said you know about creating filters. And uh, I think that's a really elegant and simple thing to do. And one of the things that I've been looking at doing, you know, again, over the years is, you know, the concept of effective hourly rates. And I know that you're a proponent of that as well. I'm wondering if you could give us your definition of effective hourly rate and how that filter, that could serve as a filter in some of the things that people are doing from a business perspective. Well, effective hourly rate, the way I work it out is just your profit yep. divided by the number of hours that you've worked. So you could take it on a on a rolling average, say a monthly profit average. Let's say for, for most practices, probably you would end up with a sort of similar, hopefully, and not too spiky. But you could roll it, you know, sort of average it out over a quarter if you want or three months. But take your average monthly profit, divide it by your average number of hours you work. That's roughly your effective hourly rate. That number is sort of an indicator as to your value to the business, more or less. And if it's a high number, then that, that's great. It means you, you're doing fairly leveraged work. If it's a very low number, maybe you should sell the practice and go get a job at McDonald's or in the food service industry because you, you could probably get paid more by someone else. Yeah, so if you're running a business very poorly, I have seen people have single digit numbers and, and have an OMG moment. It's like, wow, you know, like they're working 200 hours a month for 20 grand, then it's not that exciting, but that's not uncommon. But if they're, if they're working 300 hours for 10 grand, that's terrible. If they're working 100 hours for $100,000 profit, then that's more the sort of area where a lot of the people that I work with can get to. And that's, that's sort of a nice high-performance benchmark. $1,000 per effective hour is, is a good starting point. Yeah, and I guess one of the things that, you know, dentists will be familiar with the concept of billing out an hourly rate. There's no nothing new around that. But what I think is, you know, potentially the aha moment that people could have is how do you increase that effective hourly rate and what do you do with some of those tasks that don't actually meet that filter? You know, if I've got a task that's requiring me to, you know, 
donate my time effectively for 10 bucks an hour you know what do i do with that task it's still a patient that needs to be seen still a task that needs to be completed but you know you, you would obviously delegate that to someone else right yeah you might use it as a benchmark to say well hang on if i'm able to generate an effective hourly rate of 300 dollars in my business then uh, per hour then i might I might hire someone else to mow the lawn this week. You know, I'll spend thirty dollars, and I'm actually ahead. I could I could repurpose that hour into billable hours instead of off the map. So it kind of it picks up sneaky time sucks. That's what it's good at. Yeah, yeah that's fantastic. And certainly, again, that's a filter that I've taken into our practice as well. We we you know obviously like a lot of dentists, we we delegate less productive work to other team members. But one of the things that I do in my own time is, you know, I take on, you know, if I'm going to do clinical work, which I don't do a lot of these days, but if I am going to do clinical work, it's, you know, high value, high effective hourly rate kind of work where I can, you know, utilize my time really effectively. But to be truthful, my highest hourly or effective hourly rate is, you know, business planning, business strategy, you know, and thinking about the business. That seems to be, for me, where I can generate the most value. And I'm guessing it'd be similar with your group of clients, James. Yeah, most of the people I work with are getting paid for their ideas and for being marketers. So it's essential we protect their time, you know, to be able to do that. So, so in my case, where I'm doing some coaching, I've leveraged it by having a great business model, which is a recurring monthly subscription or recurring six monthly or recurring annual subscriptions. So that's that's one way to build up the effective hourly rate because I can get paid more for the same amount of time and. The other thing to do is to have other people do all the stuff that I can get done quite easily. Things like transcriptions or illustrations or uh, blog content or putting things on the website or managing the website. They're things that I have done in the past and that I can do, but I'm really not that good at it. And there are far more talented people than I who can do it, who you would like to be paid for it. So I get paid by my customer. I do high value work. And then I pay out some money to a team to do the stuff that has to get done, but not by me. Yeah. So James, we, we've kind of dissected, you know, why creating you know, time is good because it gives you the opportunity to think and create value for your business. We've spoken about some filters and, and whatnot, how to do it. Where do you think most business owners come unstuck though? Where, you know, when they're going, okay, James, I get this, and they go, well, I'm you know, ready to put rubber to the road. What are the common hurdles that they would encounter and you know, how would they overcome those hurdles? Well, as you're familiar with, some people are very set in their way, uh, Jesse. <laughs> where, and I think it, it seems to be the more formally educated and the more indoctrinated someone is, and I didn't mean to make a pun then, but the you know the more classical an industry the more likely you are to see some rigid norms so breaking through those i think is is the challenge it's much easier for people like me where i'm sort of forging new ground in in a newish industry there is no guidebook or university for what i do and you know so it's like it's like the wild west in a way whatever you're doing is right or wrong it doesn't matter so you know, if you if you're formally like you've obviously a smart cookie, you've been through school, which is a it teaches people how to follow instructions. You've been through a formal education process through university. You've go to, into a practice, which is a well-established thing, has been done that way for hundreds of years, and you know hard to break out of that. And then you've got all the stuff your parents put into your head and your peer group, all the guys you're playing golf with went to university with who are now your peer group and friends, that everyone's thinking one way. So to be thinking a different way is really quite a challenge. I think that's the resistance that that would come up the most. Yeah. And any thoughts about how to kind of break through that resistance? Well, the first thing is awareness. I believe it's about rewiring your software. If you were to think of your brain as some hardware and you're this human body, that's the hardware unit, you just got to install new software and, and as you know with computers or phones, you can install new software and it can now do things with the same hardware that it couldn't do before. I've spent decades rewiring my brain and thinking differently than traditional methods. So it's, it's not a, an easy or a, an instant process in some cases. There are things you can read to help you overcome resistance. There are good books for artists who write things that, you know, where they get stuck one of them is called Do the Work, 
that's a good starting point. There are also books that help you convince yourself, like using the instant influence framework. For someone who's academic, it might be the right sort of mental framework, the same framework they use in hospitals to convince drug takers to receive medical help. It could be used for kids to help them eat healthier and other other applications. So could you just touch on what that instant influence framework is, please, mate? Could you just give us a bit of a run through on that? Yeah, it's basically asking people uh, on a scale how ready for change they are. And generally, people will give a number. So, for example, I could say, Jesse, how willing to would you be to just block one day a week off your calendar for family reasons and not to go into the practice like on a scale of one to ten I, How, uh, for me or well, i do that already so i'm i'm right up there i'd be you know nine and a half ten ready to go but others others less so i accept that because i'm not in the practice so much let's say it was jesse a couple of years back okay i would have said <laughs> oh, yeah 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 probably three or four I would have I would have been resistant to that because I was still peddling hard on the old business model. I was still there was no leverage in my business model back then. Right. And and so the thing is, this is where the instant influence framework is quite good. It actually asks you why you didn't choose a lower number. Ah, okay. And it's kind of counterintuitive. It is a bit counterintuitive. Okay. Well because now it's pretty rare someone would say one, but it tells you how to deal with that too. You have to flip back to the old way. The old way would be, so Jesse, what would it take to turn your three or four into a four or five? By asking, you know, why didn't you choose a, a lower number? You have to now justify why you want to change. You see how that works? Yeah, actually, that's really cool, isn't it? I love that. So, you know, why, why didn't you choose one, for example? Well, because I want to, you know, get some leverage into my practice and I want to take some time off. And Look at I, that. Yeah, see? So it, it elicits that motivation. And then we go through an imagination step or visualization. So imagine you did have a day off in the practice. You know, what sort of positive outcomes could you expect from that? Well, I, if I had some time off or a day out of the practice, I'd be able to, yeah, a, a think more clearly about my business. So I'm not constantly reactive and I'm not constantly patient, you know, facing. I would have more time to spend with my wife, my kids. I could do school pickups and drop offs. I could, you, you know, go and see a movie during the day. You know, I could get some of those tasks done that require me to go and visit others, accountants, lawyers, and whoever. And if all of that was already handled, I could probably catch up on some sleep. Right. And so so then the next one is why those outcomes important. And that really works on your why. And it gets, again, you saying all these positives. And then the last step is what would be the next step, if any. So that's very sort of non-pushy. So it's really like a great cousin to the spin selling program that I use for years and years and years to sell, which focuses more on problems and implications. This focuses a lot more on positive outcomes and implications. So they're, it's like brother and sister formulas that I found to be an effective, you know, if I could only have two formulas, I think those ones would, would help you sell more and help you get more done. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. I really like that. I hadn't come across that before, mate. As soon as this podcast is done, I'm going to be yeah, reading up on that. That's really cool. And on a scale of 1 to 10, how ready to buy that book and read it are you, Jesse? I'm, I'm ready to buy that book on a scale. I reckon I know where I'm going now. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm going to say 9. And then you ask me why I didn't choose a lower number, right? <laughs> you, got it. you got it. You almost don't need to read it. But, no. you know. That, that once you know that, and you know, this, this sort of reminds me of a situation that happened to me when I went to the dentist. He actually said that I'm a grinder and he recommended that I have a, a mouth guard. And when he got the thing, we went through all the measuring process, you know, the squeeze down on that stuff. And then I had to go for the fitting. And then he, he used some, some very negative hypnosis. He said, look, you're going to hate this. You're going to want to throw it across the room. Everyone who tries it doesn't like it at first you'll get used to it. And I thought, man, if you just, if you just, if you knew what you were saying, if he could reword that, he could get a completely different outcome. But it's just an example of what our self-talk does and how programmed we are for the negative outcomes and how deeply rooted in us it is. So for that dentist, I would recommend he switches that to say, even if you have some initial resistance to it, what you will find is that whether it takes a day or a week, it's going to become just a part of normal living and you'll certainly sleep better because your teeth aren't touching each other. And I think you're going to really enjoy this. 
So that would be a completely different expectation that he's setting. I think he would actually cause people to be more successful. And I'm not just talking theory here. There's been research of children's classrooms where they had the teacher stop doing that thing that teachers do. You know, 90% of this room are going to fail this exam or fail this class. When they turn that to the positive, that, you know, a great portion of this class is going to succeed and, and pass then that's the expectation set from the beginning. So we can actually talk to ourselves in this manner. So we could say, I've listened to this podcast. I've got a few action items and I'm looking forward to the new version of the lifestyle that I'm designing because I'm in control. I can make these choices. And even if people resist me or don't understand me, I'm just going to let that wash off and move forward with my new program and give it a chance to succeed and see how I feel about it down the track. And I would predict that there'll be some significant changes as a result of this particular episode because of the actions taken, you know, using a couple of the ideas here. If you combine them, then it's very powerful. You'd get geometric growth as uh, my friend and mentor Jay Abraham would talk about just working on multiple things at once. You get compound results yeah that's fantastic so uh, james we've covered a lot on that there's a huge amount of value in that last little passage in, in fact the whole podcast of course but that whole reframing of everything is really really critical and for anyone listening i'd really encourage you to take that to heart and put it into action hey mate we're going to wrap up in a sec and uh, firstly before we do i want to say thank you because i know you do you look after your time really really elegantly and you, you're very cautious about what you do let into your schedule so i want to say thanks so much for taking the time out of your schedule to spend some time with us if you were a dentist listening to this podcast and we're thinking about three key action steps that you think would have the biggest you know difference right now from all the stuff we've covered whether it's you know you know what we do more of what we do less of becoming simplified in our approach to life and all those sorts of things where do you think the three key action items might lie for today i'm sure there'll be more but three biggies well, three might be too, too many, but I would say join Jesse's program because he's a dentist and he's already figured this out. So he's, he's got the playbook. That, uh, that's really an obvious action step is to learn from someone who's already done it, you know, whatever industry. If I wanted to learn how to build amazing V8 engines, I would find a top mechanic who, who's producing <laughs> race winning engines. So that would be the action step. If you wanted to go for the bonus ones, I would say... Of the notes that you took down from this call, and I'm guessing you're the type that takes notes or maybe even pause this audio a few times to write things down because I'm just, I'm just guessing. That's how I imagine you're listening to yeah, this. I reckon you're right, mate. I would circle just a few things that really resonate and I'd implement them into your schedule. So if, it's, if you want to go with blocking off a half day a week from now on forever in your life, go into your calendar, whatever it is and block it, send a memo off to your team or whoever and, and, and let the family know, you know, from now on, on Thursday, from midday onwards, I won't be in the practice. I'm trying a new thing. And you can call it a pilot program. That's a great way to lower resistance from people around you because it doesn't imply forever. It's, it's just, you know, that's a suck it and see approach. But it'd be pretty hard to go back. I, I wouldn't wouldn't like to open up my Fridays and Mondays again. It wouldn't make any sense after years worth of getting away with it. <laughs> it's almost like I'm, I'm beating society. You are. And it, like, quite, it is crazy going to the cinema on a Monday and being the only two people, I go with my partner, in the cinema on a weekday on this huge place. And I think, how can they justify even opening this place? There's no one here. But living counter-cyclically is like the, the hidden gold in this whole message. And the third thing would be identify the tasks that you are doing that you know you shouldn't be doing. You already know what they are. You're just being stubborn and doing them anyway. Just go to the effort to find someone to do it and train them. It'll be a little bit of initial effort, but it will free you for the rest of your life. And, and a pertinent example here for me was when I was doing podcasts and I've done probably a thousand podcasts, Jesse. I really have done You've a lot. You've done bazillions. And the, the first hundreds, I edited them all myself. Oh, wow. And I'm not even an audio engineer. You know, this, <laughs> since, since I hired someone to just do them for me, I had less resistance to create them because there was this whole sabotage thing going on. 
if I open my mouth and start recording something, I'm just committing myself to hours worth of editing. So guess what? You pull back a bit on the production. So it's it's now it's a case of it, it actually has no impact on me. If I record more, all that happens is I bring more people to my community and I don't have to edit them. So it's very liberating. So I would say pick one task and palm it off and see see if you get a taste for it. And if it worked for you, keep doing it. Yeah, look, I think that whole reductionist strategy is really, really powerful. Cut stuff away until it stops making sense. So that's fantastic. James, you've been incredibly generous with your time today. And on behalf of all the listeners and particularly myself, thank you, mate. You, you've been you know, a gem as always and you know, lots and lots of wisdom in the last you know, 30, 40 minutes. And uh, I really appreciate it, mate. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Jesse. You're welcome, mate. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist podcast. For more episodes, go to drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist. And to discover how to build a high-performance dental practice, visit drjessegreen.com and download the free report. 